Jesus said, I am the way, come. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth, come and receive. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life, come, receive and respond. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we gather together, even though we're separated by kilometres, we gather in your name. Listen to us and bring us peace. Be our rock and our refuge, that we may be made strong. Let your face shine upon us, that we may show your love. Together, Lord, we come and seek the Jesus, the way. May your truth fill us with wisdom to see your presence in all that we do and in all the people we meet. And may we receive new life that we may serve you in all that we are. Our Lord, our God, we bless and praise you for the life you lived. We praise and adore you for the truth you teach. We praise and adore you for the way you call us to follow. O oh Lord our God, we bless you and praise you. Amen. Welcome to worship. I'd like to wish every mother out there a happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to, to my mum, to my mother-in-law, to my beautiful wife Jane. And happy Mother's Day to all you mothers and, and mother figures that are in our congregation. I hope you have a wonderful and blessed day, full of love, peace and joy. The only announcement I have, or notice I have, is um, our Bible study started on, on Wednesday last week. We uh, looked at the first chapter of Mark. We had a great chat. It was um, a lot of information, but we all had a, a great time. So if you want to be part of our study group, um, please send me an email and I'll add you to our list and you can join us on Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock. If we claim that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just forgives us and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Let's, con let's confess our sins that we have committed against God and against our neighbours. 
Jesus is the way. Yet we have gone our own way. We think our way is better. Our way is less costly, quicker and safe. Our way does not hold any hidden surprises. Our way doesn't make any unreasonable demands. And we know that our way is the wrong way. Lord, forgive us. Jesus, the truth. I, we prefer to cobble together our own truths. A wise, a wise tale from here, a bit homes, of homespun philosophy from there. The example set by celebrity. We mix it all together with our own lessons from the university of our life. And what do we have? Our truth always offers us comfortable answers. And I, I know that our truth is a poor substitute for God's truth. God, forgive us. Jesus is life, fullness of life. Yet we are quite happy with a half-life, without risk. A calculated life. A life that holds something back for later. A life that avoids the real depths of passion and love for fear and getting hurt. A life turned inwards, lived with us at the centre. And I know our life could be much, much more. Lord, forgive us. Lord, we have sinned against you and against each other. Yet you offer forgiveness and love much more than we have a right to ask for. Jesus is the way. His is the way to forgiveness, the way to peace, the way to reconciliation. Jesus is the truth. We may confidently believe that we are forgiven. This is a moment for new beginnings. Jesus is life. Our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Today's Bible reading is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 14, verses 1 to 14. Jesus, the way to the Father. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ.
Let's pray. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and redeemer. May there be more of you and less of me in the words I'm about, about to deliver. Please open our hearts and our minds to what you'd like us to take out of the reading that Jane has just given us and from the sermon I'm about to deliver. Amen. Our reading is from the Gospel according to John and it happens on Jesus' last night with his disciples just hours before his arrest in the garden. It's the night before his crucifixion. Jesus foretells his betrayal by, Ju by Judas. He foretells that Peter will deny him three times. And he tells his disciples that in, in a passage just before the one Jane read. He tells his disciples that I'm with you, no, uh, I'm with you a little longer. You will look for me and as I said to the Jews, so I now say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Now Jesus is with his closest friends, and he starts by telling them, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God also believe in me. Now hang on, imagine that you're there with the disciples. Jesus has just told you that one of, them is a, one of you is a traitor, that one of them will deny knowing him, and that very night Jesus was going to leave them and they can't follow. Now I think the disciples have a right to be a little troubled. If we, if we read closer though, Jesus told them not to have a troubled heart. He never promised them or us that our lives would have no trouble. Quite the opposite. The life of a follower of Jesus is never going to be easy. We should be constantly uncomfortable, constantly challenged. We should serve others and put ourselves last. If you thought that your life as a follower of Jesus the Christ was going to be easy. You obviously didn't read the fine print. Being a disciple is a hard life, but it's a blessed one. The world around us should hate us. Jesus tells his disciples this much in chapter 15, verses 18 to 20 of John's Gospel. He says, If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before you. If you, belong to, uh, you. if you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. Because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember, that, uh, remember the word that I said to you. Servants are not greater than their masters. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. As Christians, we should stand out as different and remind people of how they should be living. Now, I'm not saying to um, tell everyone that they're going to hell, screaming it out on a street corner. First, you'd look like a crazy person. And the image we have in our head of hell isn't biblical. Our modern idea of hell originates from a 14th century poem. The Divine Comedy by Dante. It was then perpetuated by the church as a way to control people through fear and guilt. And then, more, most recently, it was picked up by Hollywood and the media. Secondly, it's actually actions. It's the things we do, the way we serve others, that speak loudest as a Christian eyewitness. Jesus tells us to love our God and love every other person. It's important to remember that everybody is made in the image of God. So if we, if we fail to love even the ones we, call, we think of as enemies, we fail to love God. So no, Jesus has never promised us a life without trouble. 
but he did promise us we could have peace and an untroubled heart. The peace that passes all understanding is ours because we believe in God and we believe in Jesus. Jesus says, you believe in God, believe also in me. Instead of giving into a troubled heart, Jesus told the disciples to firmly put their trust in God and in Jesus himself. This way Jesus is acknowledging the disciples' fear without endorsing it. Instead of making their fear the focus, Jesus calls them to faith. This was a radical call, but it's not an irrational one. To trust Jesus is um, just like we trust God the Father. It's a radical promise that he, um, he gives as well, that doing so would bring us comfort and un- comfort, peace and untroubled heart. Friends often tell us not to worry. So we, we put on a brave face, but inside we still worry anyway. However, when we obey Jesus' counsel and believe in God and trust in Jesus, our worries lose their power and we gain an element of peace. Then Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to his father's house, which has many mansions, and he goes there to prepare one for us. Jesus is saying that he's going to heaven and there is space for us. Or is he? Let's have a think about that. Perhaps, perhaps not. Now the word John uses that is translated as mansion or room, depending on the the version of a Bible you're reading, is used elsewhere in John to mean a relationship. The Greek word is used in this instance is often translated otherwhere in John's gospel as abide or abiding. Jesus uses the word abide to describe close relationships. Yes, I believe we will be with Christ when Jesus comes again and remakes heaven and earth. John, who wrote the gospel where we are reading this from, also wrote the book of Revelation. Now the first verses in Revelation 21 show us that John understands heaven to be God's throne. It says, at the end of days, heaven will come down to earth and heaven and earth will be made new and be perfect as it was in the beginning. No sickness, sin or death. And we will be there with God who will reign forever. That is a Christian hope. We are saved through grace and faith. If we believe in God and trust and believe in Christ, we are saved through, no, through grace and no effort of our own. Jesus says, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. The entire focus of heaven is being, is being united in, with each other and with God and Christ. Heaven is not heaven because of the streets being paved with gold or the pearly gates or even the presence of angels. That image of heaven is as equally dubious as the image we have of hell in our heads. Heaven is heaven because Jesus is there. We will be united with him and with each other. It will be heaven on earth. Jesus says, and you know the way to the place where I'm going. And the ever-practical Thomas, I love Thomas, and and Peter, I think you could probably sum up my whole personality, Um, and I'm sure a lot of you will identify with these two characters as well. Thomas gets a bad rap. But he's just asking questions that we would ask, I'm sure. And Peter, who acts first, and says things that just come into his mind without thinking of the consequences. He seems to only open his mouth to change feet. He acts rashly and finds himself in all kinds of trouble. Anyway, back to our passage. Our our Thomas, one of my favourites. 
Thomas says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? It's a fair enough question, I reckon. Jesus was being pretty cryptic. And then we come to verse 6 in in Jesus' answer to Thomas. It's a well-known verse and a very problematic verse, especially the second part. Now, Jesus answers Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay, so I am the way, the truth and the life. This is Jesus telling us that he's God. So I can just about see you in in your, your living room or wherever you're watching this going, hang on a minute, Aaron. What do you mean Jesus is telling us he's God? He doesn't say I'm God. Let me explain. John, um, the, the book of John, uh, the book, the gospel according to John, has many of Jesus's I am statements. Now, if you go back to Exodus, when Moses asks God for his name on uh, Mount Sinai, after much, much, much pestering, God finally tells him, I am who I am. He says further, you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Jesus is very deliberately using this term. He very deliberately says, I am the way. Jesus didn't say that he would show us a way. He says, I am the way. Jesus didn't promise to teach us a truth. He says, I am the truth. Jesus didn't offer us the secrets of life. He says, I am the life. God is the way. God is the truth. God is the life. Now, if you remember back to last week, um, we are talking about how Jesus was the good shepherd and that simultaneously he was identifying himself as the, the shepherd, the gatekeeper, and the gate of the sheepfold. Now here Jesus is once again kind of saying he is the gate. He is the way to get to the Father. Verse 6 needs to be understood with verse 7 and Philip's question in verse 8, which is why you really can't just take one verse out and and try and make it say what you want to say. Here Jesus says in verse 7, If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. And Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, I have been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So now that problematic end of verse 6, which has for so long been wrongly used to exclude people, the the part that says, now uh, no one comes to the Father except through me. Now we can understand that it's not an exclusive statement at all. Jesus is saying, The only way to get, uh, Jesus isn't saying rather, the only way to get into heaven, remembering what I I just told you about heaven uh, anyway, um, what Jesus is saying is that he and the Father are one. I am the only way to the Father. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus explained why he was the only way to God because He was and is the perfect representation of God. He is God. To know Jesus is to know God. Therefore, the only earthly way to know the Father is to know Jesus. This reading is about relationships. It's not about a mystical way to get into this mythical idea we have of heaven. Remember, John understands heaven to be the throne of God, which at the end of time will be united with earth to remake heaven and earth. 
So, what are we to make of this passage? What are we, going, what are we to take out of this passage? Well, just like his disciples, Jesus loves us. He wants us to have untroubled hearts. Jesus and the Father are one. So if we have a relationship with Jesus, we have a relationship with the Father. God will remake heaven and earth and live with us because we are saved through faith and through grace. God will live, us forever, with, live with us forever on the new earth, remade to be perfect and free of sickness, illness and death. Now that is something to be hopeful, hopeful about. That should bring us peace in our troubled hearts. Even though life may be hard, we have the promise of living with the loving God that created us, one who loves us and wants us to know him. Uh, I've, some people remember this saying, uh, I've used it a couple of times before, and God loves us and there's nothing we can do about it. And Jesus tells us, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and also believe in me. Amen.